Justice Brett Kavanaugh confirmed to the Supreme Court of the United States what happens next. I uh, hit the mic. <clears throat> John Doyle in. Heck off, commie. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. If I can be so bold as to say those words in 2018, welcome to Heck Off Kami. If you are new here, please subscribe. We are more than happy to have you. Now, today we're here to talk about none other than Justice Brett Kavanaugh and what we can all learn from the absolutely atrocious confirmation process that this man was unfortunately subjected to by the leftists occupying both Washington and the media. Now, the most important thing about observing the evolution of the accusations that were made against Brett Kavanaugh and also how people in the public eye were reacting to them is that no, virtually no one who was not viewing this process through the tainted and disturbed lens of an ideology was watching these events play out thinking that this wasn't a vindictive political attack on a man who has otherwise led a productive and selfless life completely free of scandal. And it's not a crazy right-wing conspiracy theory to state that Democrats were planning on doing this from the beginning. They were willing to do whatever they had to do to stop Judge Kavanaugh from elevating to the Supreme Court that did not want him there from the beginning. They literally said this on the record. The only thing that was surprising, actually not surprising, but rather shocking, was the means by which they acted in their attempts to reach these ends. Here are some highlights of some particularly low IQ individuals within the highest levels of the United States government just totally slandering Brett Kavanaugh within 24 hours of Trump announcing him as his Supreme Court pick. Now, his last second night, Supreme Court pick. President Trump took a step that millions of Americans feared he would take and nominated to the Supreme Court, someone who would fill his campaign promise to overturn Roe and declare health care for Americans unconstitutional. So, Brett Kavanaugh has never explicitly stated that he would vote to overturn Roe v. Wade. Um, even CNN, fake news CNN of all sources admits this. Brett Kavanaugh isn't even that partisan, which we'll talk more about later, but he's actually been described as a textualist. Now, the reason that the left has a problem with this is because it's very hard to legislate from the bench, like they've been having a blast doing since the 1960s, if you maintain a strict, literal interpretation of the Constitution. It's very difficult to interpret the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people, which is essentially James Madison telling those opposed to federalism, hey guys, well, if you only highlight certain rights in this document, the government could just be like, all right, well, you guys can have fun with those, but anything else that you didn't put in there, well, you can just basically forget about it. Here's the best part. James Madison was a federalist. James Madison was the federalist. He co-authored the federalist papers with Alexander Hamilton. For God's sake, Madison pitched this amendment to the anti-federalists to be a proponent of federalism, a proponent of the rights of both the state and the individual. And then the left decided to interpret this later as a mandate that all 50 states must allow legal access to abortion, the exact opposite of the founding principles of federalism. If Roe v. Wade was, if Roe, excuse me, Roe v. Wade was overturned, it would just go back to the states to decide. And that's all conservatives want. Just give it back to the states. Stop enforcing the murder of children via an incorrect interpretation of James Madison's brilliance. Conservatives will always advocate for a strict interpretation of the Constitution, which, of course, will always be a roadblock to a political party that is trying to fundamentally change and undermine it. I mean, I can't... It will never cease to amaze me how little our elected officials actually know about the Constitution. And it's funny because he says that, like, people listening will go, oh, well, geez, that doesn't sound too good. He's trying to take our health care away. Like, as if it actually says in the Constitution, like, Article 8, the hidden article. By the way, free health care, and, and, and conservatives are just trying to take it away from you guys. And, like, it just doesn't exist in the Constitution, you absolute doorknob. Listen, if you are a young woman in America, or you care about a young woman in America, pay close attention to this nomination. I have been. Pay close attention. That's the kicker. Because... Kavanaugh has made his purpose clear. He told us that when he was on that list. Look at Schumer just having an absolute ball back there. In every decision that he has made on the issue of choice. And let's be clear about what this is about. It's about government taking on the decision about a woman and what she does with her body instead of giving that woman and her family and her God the power to make the decision for herself. I think Schumer's body language is really important there because you can see that 
you know, he's in his normal state. He's just having fun with his colleagues and stuff. And then, you know, when he was up there speaking, he was, you know, he was in his character because he doesn't actually believe anything he's saying about, you know, the government stripping rights away. Uh, he, he, he believes none of it. So he's basically just doing um, a version of live action role playing that has just gotten way too deep because he accidentally became the minority leader in the United States Senate. But um, nothing that she just said has any actual substance to it. But regardless, which women are you referring to? There's this narrative that the left likes to perpetuate that all women are inherently pro-abortion and therefore need to unite against the conservatives despite only 46 percent of women actually actually excuse me actually describing themselves as pro-choice which by the way is a euphemism for pro-abortion and since you seem to care so much about individuals having the power to choose for themselves why don't you advocate for states to decide for them instead of mandating this at the federal level just let the states do it and do you know how many stupid decisions have to be made before an abortion could even begin to be argued to be necessary. I mean, I don't want to get too into this because I do want to get back to Kavanaugh, but perhaps by legalizing abortion, you have removed the subconscious incentive for women to not make these stupid decisions and be responsible because they know that if all else fails, I can just kill the baby. Um, back to Kavanaugh. And I don't even want to get too into the details of the allegations that were launched to get him because they're just absolutely disgusting, and especially the way that they were handled. Um, and it's all that anyone has talked about or heard about for the last month. But I do want to mention a few things that hopefully can be used as lessons, though I doubt they will, but we will see. Um, firstly, this entire process has completely slaughtered the presumption of innocence that we are entitled to. The left knew that they had absolutely no corroborating evidence to back up claims that were made by Dr. Ford, so they relied entirely on emotionally based arguments saying that, well, we have to believe her. She's a survivor, and if you don't believe survivors automatically, you're sexist. That's not it. It's really not. I just don't believe that hollow allegations that are twice as old as I am are enough to bar a man from a position that he is undeniably qualified for. Uh, I saw this the other day. Take a look at this. This is propaganda, just literal propaganda from the ACLU that they were trying to air before the final vote on Kavanaugh to reel more Americans into this absolutely BS narrative. Just pathetic. My name is Christine Blasey Ford. I am here today not because I want to be. I am here because I believe it is my civic duty to tell you what happened to me while Brett Kavanaugh and I were in high school. Ramirez told the New Yorker magazine Kavanaugh To be fair, that actually is halfway decent production in value. If I were a low information voter, I might be compelled to believe her based off of that. But, I mean, you saw that. You just watched that. What did it look like to you? Like, I'm not the only one that thinks, I mean... It was literally designed to look like one of those humane society commercials with all the sad dogs and you know they're looking in the beautiful like slow singing and everything. It was just engineered to make the viewer feel absolutely disgusted with themselves if they don't believe Dr. Ford's allegations. And we can't just believe. We need evidence. If there were evidence, you wouldn't even need to encourage people to believe because if they denied then you'd just be denying reality at that point. But they actually did try and fight back against the claims that there was no corroborating evidence, uh, but of course it failed. Maisie Hirono here, who is just a real piece of work throughout this entire ordeal. I also note that in your interview that she kept saying that there was no corroboration. Uh, there was no corroboration on Brett Kavanaugh's bald False. assertion that he didn't do it because the people that the FBI interviewed, which was uh, just a small number of the dozens that they should have interviewed, they all said that uh, they have no recollection. That is hardly what I would call exoneration, but on her side. There was corroboration because she had talked about this assault to her husband, to others, before Brett Kavanaugh was ever nominated to the Supreme Court. She took a lie detector test. Corroboration was there. Okay, sure. So she allegedly talked about the assault to her husband and to her therapist. And then when the Senate Judiciary Committee was like, oh, well, can we see the evidence of this? Let's see the therapist notes. And she was like, eh. So... All that really is, in reality, is just more hollow claims to reinforce an already hollow claim. She was given the opportunity to make a hard case for herself, but she withheld. Is that fishy? Probably. Also, literally no one cares about the polygraph test because they're not scientific. They're often unreliable, which is why they cannot be used as evidence in a court of law. There's also a boatload of inconsistencies within her testimony, which was under oath, by the way. Um, one of the statements that she did make, though, was particularly tragic, and it was hard not to listen to this without feeling absolutely awful for her, which explains why the media covered it so immensely. Well, can you tell us what impact the events had on you? Um, well, I think that the sequelae of sexual assault varies by person. So for me personally, uh, anxiety, Phobia and PTSD-like symptoms are the types of things that I've been coping with. So uh, more specifically, claustrophobia, 
panic and that type of thing. Is that the reason for the second door, front door? Correct. Is claustrophobia? Feinstein really, really put the ball on the tee for that one, didn't she? Uh, now, she claims that you know the PTSD-like symptoms were so intense that she and her husband entered into a disagreement about the installation of a second front door during the remodeling of their house in 2012, which is why they were speaking to a therapist in the first place because of that problem. But the documents show otherwise. Um, according to the documents, the door was installed years before as part of an addition and was used by renters and even to lease space to a business. Um, in fact, Powell Alto City, excuse me, Powell Alto City records show that this permit was issued to them in 2008, four years before the supposed therapy session, which is important because building permits are usually only good for like, what, six months? Also, she has a second home, uh, and there's no second front door on it. She and her husband bought a beach house in 2007, and this July, during the same time period in which she authored the letter to Senator Feinstein, she did apply for permits for this address, but they were for a front porch and new decking. Here's the thing that the Democrats don't be, seem to be understanding. People are sick of your identity politics. Absolutely sick. People are sick of your political correctness, and people are sick of your absolutely despicable political stunts that your media promote willingly because they're just as despicable, if not more so, than you are. This sort of behavior is the reason that Donald Trump was elected. But instead of observing that and learning from it, the Democrats have decided to literally double down on it and just become even worse than I could have imagined. And people are absolutely fed up with it. This so-called blue wave that they've been so sure of ever since Trump was inaugurated is actually not looking too promising for them right now. The blue wave, by the way, is just historically something that tends to happen during the midterm elections that follow a presidency. Um, the party that is opposite that of the president's tends to do very well, but the left has actually managed to hurt their chances here through this witch hunt against Brett Kavanaugh, which actually was originally designed to increase their support, but of course it failed. The IBD TIPP poll, which is credited as being the most accurate poll during the last four presidential election cycles, and it was actually um, one of only two pollsters that predicted President Trump's victory in 2016, they had Democrats up a month ago by 11 points. As of right now, Democrats are up by two points, which is within the margin of error. But I hope it was worth it. I hope grilling this man and ruining his reputation to make yourself look like a hero and a champion of women's rights, Cory Booker, former groper of women, who would actually prefer that um, I refer to him as Spartacus. But speaking of Spartacus, look who actually became Spartacus. Lindsey Graham, none other than Lindsey Graham of all people, the mild-mannered, soft-spoken Southerner from South Carolina. Lindsey Graham of all people. I have watched this footage. I, I couldn't even tell you how many times. It's absolutely beautiful. I love it. If you wanted an FBI investigation, you could have come to us. What you want to do is destroy this guy's life, hold this seat open, and hope you win in 2020. You said that, not me. You've got nothing to apologize for. When Look at Kavanaugh's body language here. The body language is very important because you can tell that, you know, he's very relieved and even a bit excited that somebody is finally standing up for him and saying the things that I'm sure everybody in the room was also thinking. But he also maintains, you know, he's very composed about it and doesn't really let that show too much, um, which is interesting because then the left said, well, he didn't have a very judicial temperament during the hearing, um, which is probably a side effect of him being accused of being a gang rapist without any evidence. But that's just my opinion now. I've never particularly liked Lindsey Graham. In fact, I've probably been um, relatively anti-Lindsey Graham in the past, especially with matters pertaining to President Trump. But this man has single-handedly restored my faith in the Republican establishment. He's been affectionately labeled based Lindsey Graham, Lindsey Graham 2.0, whatever you want to call it. I absolutely love it. Now, only under a President Donald Trump would a Supreme Court nomination with such a smear campaign launched against him actually make it to the bench. Donald Trump with sidecar Lindsey Graham, whatever you want to call it, they are restoring something to the Republican Party that has been absent for many moons. Guts. R Lindsey Graham telling the Democrats to their faces what everyone else in the room is thinking, this re inspired Republicans immensely because now we're finally developing a platform that says, you want to call me a racist? You want to call me a sexist? You want to call me a bigot because I disagree with you on policy? Screw you. Screw that. I'm not going to sit back and take it and I'm not going to apologize. I'm not going to let you systematically slander me for your own political gain. Oftentimes Republicans, they get so fed up with the spineless leadership within their own party. They don't even bother to show up for midterms. But I, why would they? I mean, I elected you. You were a pushover, your problem, but not this time. So what can we take away from all this? Persevere against the attacks from the left. When you persevere in the face of what everyone can blatantly see is BS, you inspire others to do the same. And maybe you'll incentivize the left to stop launching these smear campaigns. I doubt it, but perhaps. <laughs> Brett Kavanaugh. Nevertheless, he persisted. That's great. I'm going to get that tattooed somewhere on my body. Now, anyways, 
To celebrate Justice Brett Kavanaugh being confirmed to the Supreme Court of the United States, I could think of no better way than to celebrate than to crack open a cold beer for him, but I personally do not drink, so instead I will pour one out for the leftists who have tried and once again failed to make political progress by utilizing divisive and radical tactics. I, for one, am still far from tired of winning. Hey, if you like this video, go ahead and smash that subscribe button. And if you uh, want to leave me a like too or share this video with your friends, it really helps me out. Maybe even forward it to a liberal colleague of yours. It's your choice. Very pro-choice. That's a joke. Um, follow me on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram for updates and such. And uh, I will see you next time. Thank you so much for watching and may God bless America.